helping us write newsletter articles and a variety of other options. Christina Quinn is here. She's been helpful with uh, Sierra Club also. So we appreciate all the volunteers that have helped us. Um, we'd like to start this presentation with an acknowledgement of the Coast Salish neighbors. We acknowledge that this land is the traditional territory of the Lummi and Nooksack peoples. Their presence is imbued in these mountains, valleys, waterways, and shorelines. May we nurture our relationship with our Coast Salish neighbors and the shared responsibilities of their homelands where we reside today. We do have a couple of housekeeping items. The restroom is located back here. They are on a septic tank and they do have rules that um, please follow so they don't have issues. The table on the back wall is a piece of art so please don't put anything on it or set anything on it. There's also a beautiful handmade um, prayer wheel in the back. There's also paper and, and cards if you'd like to leave a message and I guess complete the sign-in, which you're already doing. Um, we do have a number of upcoming events that we'll discuss after the presentation, so if you could stick around for just a few minutes, we'll review some of the information on the board. Um, and with that, we'd like to introduce David Roberts, which I lost. <laughs> and, you, you want to introduce yourself? Okay. <laughs> well, thank you, everybody. I really uh, appreciate you all being out here today. This is a, a talk that is basically a um, sort of a summary of uh, a six-hour program I did for the Academy of Lifelong Learning at Western. 
and decided I would just take that on the road, just knowing that there's an ever-growing interest in the climate situation and uh, where it's going, and uh, oftentimes people don't necessarily have a real good understanding of all the ins and outs of what's going on. It's a very dynamic time right now where a lot of information is coming together. Literally, uh, last night, uh, my wife Allison was pulling articles and saying, well, here's the latest, you know, and we try to add it in there. So um, I'm, uh, this program is about an hour, so uh, do you feel like you need a, like, a little break in the middle? I know people are saying, no. just plow right through, plow right through. Plow right through. Okay, and then we'll have... So the best thing will be to, you know, kind of hang on to your questions and we'll have a little question and answer um, when we get to the end. Allison has uh, some handouts so that the main points of the talk are all captured on one side of an eight and a half by 11 paper. So oh. you don't have to t take a ton of notes or anything or try and keep it in your mind. All the goodies are there. Um, not enough, though. Not so enough. There's only 25, so Lynn is going to have the... I didn't expect such a big group. So Lynn will have uh, the file, and if you want it, um, she can uh, send it out or, or let everybody know that it's available, okay? So, um, Danny, Natalie? Can you stand closer to the screen for the most of the time? Uh, yes. For those of you like, who want a copy no. of this handout, if you don't get one, yeah. if you have the email address on the sign up sheet, we'll get it to you. Does that work? That's been. Thank and, and Natalie is uh, recording the talk today so that those who weren't able to see it will get a chance to um, see it at some point in the future. Hopefully, I'm not blocking everybody's view here. Um, so, just very briefly about me uh, I am a geologist by background, but uh, mo worked most of my career in environmental, uh, various environmental programs, about 27 years with the state of Washington. Uh, in the Department of Ecology for the first uh, uh, 17 or 18 years of it in uh, mostly water-related programs. And then uh, the last nine years of my career at the state, I worked for the State Department of Natural Resources, and I managed uh, about a million and a half acres of state aquatic land uh, where we did uh, leasing of the land as well as environmental cleanup and restoration projects all throughout the seven counties in the north part of the state. Uh, I started Culture Services in uh, 2011 as a way to mostly help government talk to people and people talk to government. And uh, we focus mainly on uh, larger environmental planning efforts um, as well as um, sustainability for businesses. So we're going to start right off here and I want you to all start to think about not climate change but climate risk because that's what we really face. We are in a time right now where we don't know what the risks are. And so we are in what some people might call uncharted waters. We don't know how bad it's gonna get. We know there's increasing evidence that things are changing faster than we think. We don't know what the end point looks like, even if we do a lot of things. So we're kind of needing to adopt the precautionary principle, which is do something now, right? and hope that that's enough. And if it's not, adapt as we go. So keep that in mind. So today's talk, we're going to uh, look a little bit at opinions. And I think that for those of you who are pretty green in this crowd, I assume, uh, we'll look at how that works and how you communicate with other people. Uh, we're going to talk about briefly about weather versus climate, because there's a lot of uh, confusion about that. We'll talk about risk and, and uncertainty, or certainty. Um, we'll be looking at the scientific evidence that's out there, and most of you have seen a lot of this, but I think I can point to the key points of that, and look at how that's ultimately going to impact our world and, and the U.S., and then we'll drill right down to what's happening here locally. Then we're going to get into some good news. So I'm hoping like the last third of the talk, we'll be talking about good news, because I'm an optimist, generally. I'll admit I've had some a lot of trouble being positive right now between the politics and the and the way things are coming out of the scientific community. So, um, but we'll try and impart some positive news on you, so you can take that forward, and ultimately some things that you can do individually, sort of in a hierarchical uh, uh, level, so that um, you know what you can be doing to make a difference. Um, so the goals here are really for you to come away with an improved understanding of what's going on and give yourself some tools that you can uh, work with to 
um, help others better understand. So before we start, this is an interesting thing that uh, Allison and I learned from uh, the climate conference in, uh, that, that was uh, last year in um, Boise about how we communicate about uh, climate change. Because different people hear things in different ways. So I want you to think about each one of these. And I'm going to come back and ask you about each one of these and which rings true to you. So if you had heard this statement, harm will come to people if we do not reduce the effects of climate change. So there's one statement. Here's another one. We have a duty to protect the rights of people who will be affected by climate change. Here's another one. Reducing the effects of climate change reflects on our character and who we strive to be. And the last one, for those who don't believe, is this one. Okay? So think about each one of those. How many people would say the first statement really rings true to them? I wonder where that music's coming from. It's someone's purse up here. Oh, okay. I thought it might have been my little guy here. So how many people believe that that first one, harm will come to people if they do not reduce? So that's pretty high percentage. How about uh, we have a duty to protect the rights of people who will be affected? Okay, that's, that's interesting. Very good. And then reducing the effects of climate change reflects on our character and who we strive to be. Okay, so you're all pretty green. I would expect you to relate to a lot of those. But in fact, what's really interesting is that different people, if you look at our community as a whole, um, they basically respond to these statements in different ways. And the science that was presented at this conference, which was across the whole country looking at people's opinions. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, if you look across the country, um, typically people who um, believe in or, or basically have this ethical framework around harm are going to be liberals and whites. The people who think about duty typically are people who are religious, conservative, and oddly enough, a lot of people who are um, of color. And the last one, which I found totally interesting, was that the people who uh, really uh, relate to the idea of character are actually young people. <laughs> At the same time, young people doubt that climate change is going to impact them. So, as we talk to people, and you are, you know, I, most of you are going to be advocates for some kind of climate change, obviously, by the way you raise your hands and everything. Think about who you're talking to. And if you know your audience, oh, oh, oh boy, that was dead. Sorry, back up, back up. Excuse me. Blowing it here. If you are talking to people um, who you know are are re religious or conservative, then you want to use the word duty and talk about future generations. And this, I think, is where sometimes the environmental mu movement blows it, because we focus on harm and the environment falling apart and all that kind of thing. So think about these things, and when you talk to young people, you might talk about, well, you know, and in terms of character of the people. Obviously, they're concerned about the character of our leadership right now, right? I know I have a 27 and 24-year-old children, and they think our world is coming apart because our leadership is so messed up. Okay, so uh, and then you know, just keep that in mind that this is this is what's called framing your message. So these are real basic things. They're in your in this handout if you um, uh, if, uh, if you get a copy of it. Okay. Moving on. So obviously, it's been in the news. It's like, I think one of the greatest things is that the media, the mainstream media has finally got off their butt and said, it's happening, right? Instead of, oh, well, listening to the deniers and everything, you know, back and forth, making it a big debate in the paper. Of course, there is still debate. There's some amazing websites out there with uh, basically promoting climate denial. I mean, they, and I went, I, in preparation for my ALL class at Western, I went out to look at some of them to just see what they're talking about. And a lot of them go back to old science. Um, they go back to statements from people who years and years ago were deniers that aren't deniers anymore. And, uh, and so a lot of that's just 
a, a lot of real um, BS as far as I'm concerned. Um, so let's talk about a couple of concepts here. The first one is risk. So uh, risk is more, kind of a statistical thing. You hear about risk of cancer, right? One in a million, one in two million, that kind of a thing, right? So there's a concept around risk that um, we basically, if you, you listen to the noise out in the media, you know there's there's just not a lot of good statistical evidence for that. And we know that lots of things are coming up now and, and lots of information is coming forward that's showing more statistical rigor about the data, whether it's temperature numbers or, or that kind of thing. Um, the interesting thing with risk is that, you know, if you wait too long, boom, then everything goes, right? So you can, if you rely on, on certain kinds of risk things, um, you can get blinded to, to what's actually happening out there. The other side of it is just around certainty, and certainty has an awful lot to do with trust. Who do you trust to give you your information? And are you going to be the kind of person who's more of a skeptic? And we have people out there who are skeptics, and that's good. They ask good, hard questions, and they look for evidence, and from that evidence, they draw conclusions. Then you have deniers. And deniers is almost like a form of religion, right? They basically say, well, you know, if Uncle Joe says it's that way, then obviously it is. Or if Mr. T says it, well, then obviously that's the truth. Blind uh, following of what's going on. And, um, and so certainty, in, in for many people, is going to be tied to, do you believe scientists? Do you believe government? That kind of thing. And... Uh, and of course, that's what's happening in the media, that's what's happening in our politics, is who do you trust, where do you get your information? And, um, and so uh, that's a big part of what's going on in our, in our whole discussion, particularly in the United States. If you look at Europe, I mean, people are all over it, right? But we allow all this big conversation and have the, the politics that we have here. So now I'm gonna just take a few minutes and go through the basics of climate change. And I have to admit that um, I didn't fully understand all this stuff until I started really pulling it together. And I'm trying to stay on top of the latest that's going on. But um, even this basic concept that you have, basically the sun comes down, heats the surface of the earth, that heat radiates back up, and the heat trapping gases then hold that in the atmosphere. Then that radiates back down into, onto the Earth's surface, and it also, as we're finding now, huge amounts of it radiate into the ocean. And that's turning out to be one of the biggest and best indicators that we have. So that's the basic principle. It's down, back up, and then down into the Earth again. It's not unlike what happens in your roof. The sun heats the surface of the roof, the roof it basically radiates down into your house. And that's what makes our houses hot if we don't have enough insulation in the, in the summertime. A couple, some more basic stuff. So in the atmosphere, the primary gases that are out there are water vapor, nitrous oxide, carbon dioxide, and methane. The three that make up greenhouse gases, the three primary ones, are these three right here. The, um, the, uh, so now the, there's two different things to think about. One is the, the amount of gas, those gases that's in the atmosphere. And right now there's about 81% of the atmosphere is CO2, 10% of the, the gases are methane, 6% are nitrous oxides, and uh, what isn't shown on here is about 3%, which are the um, fluorinated gases that you know we released from all our aerosols and things for years, those remain out there. Um, the other thing is uh, um, the potency of these. So if carbon dioxide we use, you can do a math here, carbon dioxide, if you said that's value of one in terms of its impact on the uh, climate change, then, um, then methane is wow is uh, 28 to 36 times more potent as a climate uh, um, uh, uh, contaminant. And, uh, come on, there it is. But nitrous oxides are huge, 265 to 298 uh, times what CO2 is. Um, the other thing is that uh, these gases hang around it for different amounts of time. So, uh, oh, oh, jeepers, sorry. 
I got this uh, trigger happy thing going here. So um, let's do this. So uh, the nitrous oxides and the methanes generally hang around for about a hundred years. Yeah, but the CO two, of course, hangs around for thousands of years. Some of it. So there's a lot of um, to deal with how long it's out there. Um, and in terms of uh, the, the, I think the one that we really need to watch uh, is um, methane. The nitrous oxides and the carbon dioxide are largely from combustion, but methane's a bit more complicated. It comes from uh, ecological <coughs> conversion of fo uh, forest to ag land. It comes from farm animals burping. You know, it turns out sheep are more more burpable, more <laughs> methane per pound than a cow is. Interestingly enough, uh, rice production is also a source. Landfills, and you know, they often see a flare off of the landfill. Those are methane, wastewater treatment plants, biomass burning. So you know, we get the double whammy from the forest fires, right? We lose all the capacity to pull CO2 out of the air and we put methane back into the air. And then oil and gas production and supply chains and contribute to that. So it's a, it's a really important one to pay attention to. And as you'll see, it's also... Um, it's also... Um, not sure where I was going with that. Sorry. Okay, we'll keep going. Methane. Yeah. Hydrates. Permafrost. The permafrost. We'll get to that. Yes, there's natural sources as well. We'll talk about that. Thank you for reminding. Uh, so, just in terms of, I, I always get questions. Well, you know, it's not our problem, right? Well, the the first thing to look at is, you know, just who's the who are the big contributors? Obviously, China and the United States, and India, Russia. We're they're the the big four that are the main contributors in terms of total emissions, right? And then you have all these other. Uh, smaller contributions, and I don't know what the rest of the world makes up. It must be all the little tiny countries or something like that. But another way to look at it is CO2 per capita. And mm -hmm. if you look at the red ones there, those are the countries that are really pumping it out, largely due to our, you know, pretty robust economies and so forth. Um, and, uh, you know, the, did you hear that most interesting thing that the CO2 emissions went up 3.4% in the last year? Yeah. How many people heard that? Okay, so, and where did it come from? A robust economy, right? And who drove that? Amazon delivering through FedEx and those trucks that get eight miles to the gallon, right? Yeah, that was the big driver for it, right? New information is coming out every day, right? So here we are, we show the CO2 emissions per capita, but then you look at who's most impacted. So the countries that are most impacted are certainly not the ones that are generating the CO2. So you have a social equity issue that's enormous. And no matter what, I mean, I met this guy in, in Maui the other day from Canada. Not my problem. I said, what about all those poor people from Bangladesh? Where are they gonna live? So that's their problem, you know? Well, is it? Something to think about. All right, so let's look at indicators. So for 400,000 years, we had four warming and cooling trends, right? And um, the interesting thing is that these warming trends, each one of those, <coughs> somewhere around 40,000 years to occur. Well. 40,000 years, a lot of things can adapt. You know, people can adapt, plants can adapt, animals can adapt, everything can change over 40,000 years. That's no problem, right? But what happens here? So we are on the antecedent end of a, one of those 40,000 year warming trends, and boom, we're right through. Starting about 1950, we just pushed right through, right? So that doesn't look like anything for the last 400,000 years, does it? So we gotta keep this in mind that we are in uncharted waters. I think if you keep that in mind, climate risk is uncharted waters. Okay, oh boy, you know what? I'm gonna need a mouse to start this, I just realized. Um, Hey, Seth, can, or somebody back there, can you just click on that little arrow right there on my computer? <laughs> Let's see if we can do this. You gotta, you gotta see this thing. <laughs> Double click just on that arrow right there if you can. Well, 
go. Oh, you gotta see this. <laughs> yeah, well, it's not so fun. Let, let me just try it real quick. Excuse me. Because this shows how So I should have had the computer right here. But anyway, what this does is it shows you between 1880 and 2017 the how much we've had uh, anomalies in weather and in, in temperature throughout the world. It's a really cool graphic. I apologize. It's not working this morning. So it shows up. Um, we'll, uh oh. Now you're So maybe while he's getting his technical. If you read the board, the most important thing coming up is this weekend through Tuesday, we have a clean energy bill in, in committee, both in the Senate and in the um, House. So if you go on www.leg.law.gov, the Senate bill is 5116 and the House bill is 1211. And both... Um, 40, if you're in the 42nd, raise your hand because you are very important on this because Erickson is in the Environment Committee that this has to come out of. So you you are the people that could ask him as your representative to um, get this out of committee and go on to the, the, the Senate. Um, and so it, everything is very clearly spelled out in that, on that, and you can look where you plug in your 5116 and the, everything will come up on that. Um, Bob Agarder, do you want to say anything else about that? Well, if, if anybody has any questions about any of those bills afterwards, I'd be willing to talk with them, but um, no, it's... Um, it, it will go. It will go uh, to vote committee on Tuesday, and it looks pretty good. Right. So, um, these establish three new standards for electric utilities in the state: a greenhouse gas neutral standard and a clean energy standard. The bills would require the UTC, the Utilities and Transportation Committee to accelerate the depreciation schedule for any coal fire resources it operates. Um, so um, coal strip, where we get 30% of our energy, is due to close by 2027, so this would push them to a December 30, <coughs> 31st, 2025 shutdown. Um, all electric utilities must eliminate all costs associated with delivering electricity to Washington customers that are generated from coal fire resources by the state. Both bills require retail sales of electricity to Washington customers to be greenhouse gas neutral by 2030. And by 2045, electric companies must supply 100% of electric retail sales using renewable energy. So that, it has to come out of committee, and then we have to push to get it passed. 
Okay, I apologize. I thought I had that working this morning, and without a mouse right here, I, I couldn't activate it. So, anyway, if you imagine over time all those little bubbles going and everything in 2017, these are the number of, of, of countries around the world that had uh, temperature anomalies that were, you know, in the one to um, two degree higher range. So there's a lot of temperature change going on, and oh, Allison, can you hook that? There we go. Here we got it. Are you doing it or me? You did it. Okay, good. Stand out of the way because the antenna is right there, and I can't shoot through that lady. Okay, so just to show you again, sort of sense of the anomalies, the temperature situation in the world right now. Um, we're getting places where there's extreme heat. Um, here on uh, this was in. Uh, April 20th of 2017, it was over 120 degrees in, uh, in parts of Africa, India, and, um, and uh, northern part of Australia. A lot of people died, in primarily because it's often associated with extreme humidity. And when it's over about 95 degrees and 90% humidity, you can't sweat. So when you can't sweat, you boil. And that's what causes people to, to um, have become sick when it's really, really hot. The other side of this, which just doesn't show, is that actually nighttime temperatures are going up faster than daytime temperatures. Oh, so there's no cooling oh. opportunity for people in the evening in many of these um, countries as well. Uh, the other news, as I mentioned, the big stuff that came out in the last two weeks is the um, recalculation of how ocean temperatures have been increasing, even since the IPCC report. This, the, Group of scientists identified that the heating of the ocean is actually 40% faster than anybody originally um, uh, concluded. And this is in part because, of the, again, looking at statistical rigor and all that type of thing, they've reevaluated the data in a new way and um, they've determined that 93% of the heat that's in the atmosphere, that's trapped in the atmosphere, is getting transferred to the ocean as the big sink. So um, this is driving temperatures up at a much more rapid rate um, than, uh, than anybody expected. And of course, one of the impacts of that is the uh, melting of the <coughs> continental ice sheets. Now when the original calculations for years were based on melting the surface of all ice sheets in the world, and if you did that, it would take about a thousand years to raise the sea level one foot. But when you look at these enormous, like city-sized chunks of ice, which, you know, if, if you throw a big chunk of ice in a glass of water, it's eventually going to raise the water level up, right? And that's what's happening is these enormous pieces, primarily from one big glacier in uh, Greenland, and two, this is the pig, the Pine Island Glacier in uh, Antarctica, and one other site there, there are huge pieces of ice flowing in, and the problem being that the warm water is, is um, melting the toe of the glacier, which would have normally been caught by the moraine at the end, and so it's just sliding over and going in, as well as the water lubricating from the melting surface. Big issue. And of course, then there's all sorts of impacts from that. And this one I didn't quite understand at first, but, but you know, just if you take this yokel something glacier off of uh, Greenland right here, um, it's dumping a whole bunch of cold water into the Gulf Stream, and uh, it's starting to disrupt the, the flow of water um, through this area. And interestingly, it's raising the sea level. If you understand physics of cold and warm water, all that kind of thing, it's raising the sea level right here in one of the lowest lying areas of the United States. It isn't the same on the western side because it's a temperature and physics kind of thing. And all this, all this climate stuff is physics, right? It's just thermodynamics and physics and movement and so forth. And so uh, it's uh, changing the nutrient situation and it's contributing to the stronger coastal storms that are happening on the east coast of, of the United States. The other big thing that's happening that I think is just incredibly important is as a result of the warming and everything that's going on, the, the jet stream, oh, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm getting mixed up with a pointer. <laughs> I'm sorry. I should have a separate pointer in my hand. Here it is. This is the pointer right here, this little red one. Um, normally, the jet stream 
rolls along with a slight, you know, sinusoidal uh, oscillation around the Earth, and it stays really pretty fixed in place because high pressures are, and higher temperatures are down in the lower latitudes, and the cold stays up in the cold, right? But what's ending up happening is as as there's excessive heating, particularly around the equator, it's weakening. <coughs> The, um, the jet stream's normal sinusoidal uh, character, and it's making it bigger. And so the effects of that is that we're getting extreme warming, like up in Alaska, and we're getting cold weather systems that are going all the way down in Texas and Alabama, Mississippi, and that kind of thing. It also contributes, though, to the, um, because it gets uh, less, um, fixed or strong in its sense across the, the globe, um, it tends to stay in one place longer. So Houston, is that's why they had, you know, six feet of rain in two and a half days down there. Because that thing just stuck there, boom, like that, and the rain came, and the rain came, and the rain came. It's, it's uncharted waters, right? It's, uh, some people would call it the black swan, right? You know, we have calculations for river systems, for flooding and that type of thing, based on what we know, right? Our certainty. We have statistics that talk about risk. But we don't know what's going on with this stuff, only because we have never observed it before. So in the black swan, it's like, well, if every swan you ever saw your whole life was white, you would assume that all swans were white, right? Until a black one came along. This is what we're faced with, whether it's this, whether it's a stock market right now, whatever it is, we have black swans we need to think about that are creating uncertainty, and that's one of them. Uh, one of them that uh, we see expressed here in Puget Sound is the changing pH of the ocean. Of course, the, the pH has an awful lot to do with any kind of an organism that has a calcareous shell on it, right? A calcium carbonate shell. And those are right at the base of our whole food system for the ocean. And so if those organisms can't produce, reproduce properly, then that's going to cause food supply issues for the fish, which ultimately translate all the way back up to us, because so many of us depend on fish. And you can see there's changes in, big changes in pH in, in primarily in the higher latitudes right now. And we see that in Puget Sound. So, uh, we had mentioned about the permafrost. I think this is the most scary thing of all. Because you saw how potent those uh, uh, chemicals, the, the methane is in the atmosphere. And, uh, and basically, as we warm the Arctic, um, we are uh, opening up areas of permafrost. <coughs> the permafrost is releasing methane into the atmosphere at unknown rates. And we don't, you know, there's no way to stop it, right? Once it gets going. And it's actually a cyclic process. So that once it releases, it's going to warm, it's going to get warmer, it's going to release more and release more. And there are a whole cycle, a series of these different kinds of cycles in climate. This is just one of them that's a repeating and increasing kind of a positive, thing. positive feedback. That's right, Dave. Yeah. So I think this one's really <laughs> incredible. The other thing is there's all sorts of diseases that are stored in the, pro the permafrost. And as we release that permafrost that's frozen, ugh, who knows, right? What are you, what are you showing in that picture? Oh, these are methane yeah. bubbles yeah. right here coming up out of a lake that are uh, frozen. Yeah, and they're under a layer of ice? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so you take all this together, we look at impacts now, just in a basic sense. First and foremost is, where are people going to live? <laughs> And this is a chart showing, um, you know, how impacted many of the countries, even parts of South, uh, Central America, are going to be unlivable given uh, the kinds of um, risks that are associated with not doing anything. So I tell people, you think Syria is a problem? Syria is a climate problem, right? People couldn't farm anymore, so they moved to the cities, and then there was nothing for them to do. and. It, then they try to move away under oppression, right? You, if we raise the sea level or, or burn out people in these countries, sea level alone, one foot of sea level will, will displace 10% of the world's population. And this is heat and other factors. 
that are going to make many countries in the world um, really unlivable. And then, if you just look at one other factor here, there's lots of different maps of these things, but um, agricultural yields are definitely going to be impacted by drought, by storms, uh, by excessive heat. Um, and uh, you can see even large portions of the United States uh, will be affected. Of course, if you're in Canada, you're living large, uh, northern part of our country, um, we'll be in pretty good shape, but uh, lots of places in the world are going to get hit really hard. Okay, so now we're going to drill down. We're going to look at U.S. real quick, just a couple of factors. Here's June 2016. Just scorched the daylights out of us. Really hot over most of the country. Now, as I show you these things, <coughs> just pay attention to our corner of the state up here because there's going to be a statement to make. <coughs> Here's economic impacts that have been uh, projected by uh, uh, looking at uh, climate change scenarios. And obviously, a big chunk of the southeast and, and uh, southwest part of the um, country heavily impacted um, from an economic standpoint. Uh, this one's interesting. We talked about the eastern seaboard. Oh my gosh, I did it again. Sorry. Uh, um, how low lying. The eastern seaboard in Louisiana, Florida, are these are um, miles of dry land that's less than 3.3 feet above sea level, right? So you've heard that I'm not giving you a lot of statistics about sea level rise right here, but you know it's totally conceivable we could have three, six, nine feet of sea level rise before the end of the century, if not more. So um, you think about how that might affect these enormous communities in the New Jersey, North Carolina, Virginia, Florida, all the way down, and Louisiana in particular. Yeah. And here's a kind of a fun one. Where do we recreate, right? Well, back in the 70s, uh, the map looked something like this. By the 2050s, the best places to recreate are going to be here, here right? Okay, look at how big the country in July will just be too hot to do anything. And oddly enough, then where are people moving to? I just got this, got this picture day before yesterday from the uh, Census Bureau. Um, we got, you know, people moving to some of the most uh, difficult places in the country over the last uh, 10 years anyway. Of course, some of them are, have already got the picture yeah. and they're right up to see us, yeah. right? Yeah, keep that in mind. That last one, which one are the ones where people are moving and which ones aren't? So the dark radiation. ones are where the greatest amount of transition is, and the light ones are where the least amount. So they're moving out of Maine, moving to the warmer climates, the deserts, and up to see us. Okay, let's just go, now we're going to drill down even farther, and we're going to look at the community level. And I know that I think that this is the thing that most interests everybody. <clears throat> so, main, main things we're going to see here, the glaciers are retreating. So, if you think about glaciers primarily from the standpoint of summertime river flows, right? That's where the water comes, the cool water from the, from the um, in the summertime is, and much of it is coming from glaciers, particularly... <laughs> Uh, the Nooksack River, the Skagit River, they're, they're, a lot of their summertime flow comes from, uh, from glacial melt. And the glaciers, if you look at some of the data out of Western about what's happening on, on Mount Baker, the glaciers are receding dramatically all around Mount B Baker. <clears throat> but this is an interesting one. I, I think this is probably, from my standpoint, one of the more interesting facts about where we live. But in the last 50 years, the permanent snow level in our mountains adjacent to us has gone up 500 feet. So what that means is that the if you're uh, in this zone right here, you're largely, get, it's largely fall, precipitations falling as rainfall, right? Well, rainfall has a whole different characteristic that snow does. Snow is stored through, largely through the winter and then released in the spring. But as we, uh, as the elevation of that permanent snow goes up, then you get more rain-dominated storm systems, which then are uh, in stream systems that are used to having snow melt, 
and that causes oftentimes greater erosion, which causes more sediment movement and more flashy storms where this, they come in and go away. Where a snow melt condition, all those areas, they typically wait till spring and then there's a snow melt time period that's more even, right? And that's expected to continue to rise with, as we get warmer and warmer temperatures, that snow level, permanent snow level is, is anticipated to rise. And so, um, oh, Allison, where is it? Are we getting the wrong order? Okay, oh, I must have changed something. So one of the things that this causes is what might be called the big, what uh, Eric Grossman from USGS calls the big squeeze. And you think about it in terms of, if you lived, uh, say, somewhere downstream of Ferndale or you live in Mount Vernon, what's happening there is that we are getting more rain, more water, more as rain. So there actually will be more precipitation, but it will fall as rain coming down and, and it flows through to the ocean. But at the same time, we have <coughs> sea level rise pushing up from the other end. So it's like putting a cork right there. When the water comes up here, it stops the flow. You know that the river is tidally influenced in the Skagit all the way back to the city of Mount Vernon. So the cork essentially goes back to the city of Mount Vernon. So if you get a big storm and a big tide, where's the water going to go, right? And so what we're ultimately seeing is that the storms are more intense, there are frequent, river, uh, frequent high river flows, more rain, less snow, and it's pushing the sediment because of the rain-dominated system down and a longer flood season. And down at the bottom, we're seeing higher tides, we're seeing storm surges, uh, wave energy backwatering is pushing back up the river, and that causes the sediment to dump out. So you know if you're basically going across Marine Drive and you cross the river out there, that is where the delta is building out into the bay and the sediment's building back up into the river, making that lower end of the river more flood prone. Mount Vernon, if you cross over the bridge, the, you know, the big horseshoe bend is over <coughs> to your west right there, and because the river slows right there, it's dumping tons of sediment right there where they don't want it, okay? So this, I think, is one of the, for our area, from a flood standpoint, not only are we getting higher flows, we're getting shoreline flooding, and we're getting this big squeeze effect. Um, of course, where are we going to put people in the future? Um, and we know, we have a, a guest house in our house. People are staying with us, they're coming from California and saying, can't take the smoke, can't take the fires, we're moving out, right? And if you think about all those trends I showed you, where people are moving and things, I think one of the biggest things we face as a county and as an area of the state is going to be the black swan event. You know, we are, we are predicting, Seth can talk about comprehensive plans, we're, we're predicting sort of a linear growth, right? But what happens if people start getting burned out, smoked out, hurricaned out, uh, flooded out, you know? Sure. Where are we going to put those people? I changed the, I must have messed up and changed the order of this. But here's to show you, you know, with that snow melt event. Um, in, in river systems like the Samish, which is a low elevation river, it's rain dominated all the time. So it's hardly going to see any change in conditions over time. But if you look at the Snohomish or the Nooksack, what you see is instead of a little uh, fall blip and then the spring melt off, it's all pushing forward into more rain-dominated, higher flow kinds of events. So this is um, fairly typical for um, what the, the Nooksack and the Snohomish would see. The Skagit, which has a, lot, a giant watershed, lots of snow-dominated uh, flow coming out of there, they're going to see a dramatic shift from what is typically their flood season in the spring to a flood season that's much greater in, in the um, autumn and uh, early winter time period. Where are they getting their snow? From Skagit. Well, it's a larger watershed, so there's high, a lot of high mountains in it, oh. and, and just a lot not, more snow. Not mountains like Mount Baker or whatever? Well, Baker comes a li little bit of it goes that way, and then some okay. of it goes out the nooks out, right? So. 
Is most of the water supply relied on by snowpack or are, are the, the rain in general? Like, where is most of our water supply for like walk parties? Summertime, well, Lake Whatcom is one thing. It's mostly a rain-dominated system, and, it's, and it has its own watershed, right? Small watershed. But the big river system, where the irrigation is largely coming from, which in, in the summertime is like 85% of all the water use or something like that, that's coming off the Nooksack, and most of that's reliant on the snow melt out of the Middle Fork and the North Fork. So that would like fault farmers? Absolutely, like absolutely, yeah. Yeah. So here's just, I, I'm sorry, the order of these got mixed up a little bit, but this shows the, um, the uh, uh, changes of flow in a, a 2040s kind of um, oops, scenario, uh, excuse me, um, in the Nooksack uh, based on, you know, not doing anything, it would be 21 to 25% lower, and by 2080, we'd be like 25 to 30% lower. So if you think about how much our agricultural community relies on uh, on, oh, this is high flows. This is increases, high, yeah. excuse me. <coughs> and then on uh, the low flow end of it, you see we're seeing similar kinds of numbers uh, for summertime time period. So we're going to have higher flows, significantly higher flows in, as we go forward, and we're going to have significantly lower flows in the summertime. Um, talk about sea level rise a little bit. This is a little bit complicated. You know, as a whole, the ocean's coming up, right? But around Puget Sound, some places are actually sinking. If you live in Olympia, the ground around downtown is actually subsiding. Um, in other parts of Puget Sound, it's rising. Um, but overall, the sea level rise is doubling, the rate of rise is doubling every seven years right now, is the best calculation I've heard. And so you can see for, um, you know, if, if you're uh, Friday Harbor or Seattle or Tacoma, you know, you're upwards of three feet of rise by the next, by um, 2100. Again, if we're not doing anything to stop. Back at the rivers, um, how does that affect? I mean, I'm assuming that would lower the water table as well, or how does that affect the water table? In the in the summertime, it would definitely lower the water table. Yeah. In the wintertime, it raises it though, mm -hmm. right? Because yeah, it's in sense. connection yeah, with the stream. Yeah. And then you have this interesting situation where you've got uh, storm surge combined with. King tides combined with sea level rise, right? Um, and there's an example from uh, 2016, uh, 2017 where a sea dike down on the Skagit had, a, uh, after a big storm in March, had a five foot log sitting on the top of it. Well, it took at least a two or three foot wave over the top of that sea dike to put that five foot log on the top of it. So, particularly in the Skagit, the Pearl Island area is really susceptible um, to this type of thing. And of course, as we've seen uh, recently, there, the, um, there are issues um, along other parts of Whatcom County. Another big uh, uh, trend right now is towards uh, more forest fires, particularly on the western side of the state. Historically, about 10% of the fires in the state happen on the, on the west side. That's now increased to 25% um, fires. This is a this is a shot uh, right off of my front step, looking out towards on the other side of Galbraith Mountain, um, just to show you how susceptible we are. There was another one up here on Lookout Mountain the summer before, and of course, the, if you don't get the smoke in August, it as a problem for us. That that's something new, right? I mean, it's been like the last two or three years. Um, there's a huge health effects associated with that. Most of our fire smoke came from BC, um, which was interesting because we had winds off the coast coming towards us, and we had high winds coming from Canada that brought the smoke down and just pumped it down on top of us. So this is a real indication. BC burned five million acres of forest in two summers. And of course, the, all these uh, water issues are uh, likely to be impacting our Chinook, and, and of course, that's all tied to our orcas and, and what happens there. Um, we talk about water supplies, challenges that it's gonna, the farming community in particular is going to face in the future, uh, flooding issues that are, that are, um, are you know, already challenging and uh, will be made more severe. Um, and then, of course, the sea level rise. So this was December, the big windstorm. 
at Skyline in Anacortes. What do you think if you were sitting in those windows right there? Wow. And of course, uh, if you were in Birch Bay, that restaurant that should never be out where it is. Yeah. Uh, got that they rebuild every year. What about Boulevard Park? <laughs> right? I mean, it's barely high enough. I mean, it isn't really high enough. They built those rocks up now, which are just going to keep the, the splash off, right? And uh, Allison, you may have to start this one. I don't know if it'll work or not. But um, this is Marine Park. And I hope this doesn't jam us up again. There. Okay. So this is Eric Grossman's video of. Marine Park. Now, if we start to think about infrastructure and wave action on a king tide in a park that's relatively new and a drain line that's been there for a long, long time, um, you know, it, there's there's the tree, right? <laughs> right on the beach there. So this is what, when you get a storm surge, and we are getting more and more low pressure systems, right? Low pressure can raise the sea level in Puget Sound two feet. So now you get a sea level rise, king tide, storm surge, and a two foot rise from a low pressure. And those low pressures, as they get deeper, the angle that they're hitting the, the shoreline is a little different. So its erosion's a little different. Longer fetch distance makes more uh, bigger waves. So all these things are combined together. It's not just sea level rise, it's changes in the weather system. Okay, let's get that past there. There we go. So again, where are we gonna put all these refugees? And where are we gonna get the chocolate and the coffee? <laughs> 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 I have to thank Allison for putting it in there. We need a little levity after all this. All right, yeah, let's, we do. Okay. let's get on to the, uh, just real quick, a couple of local planning efforts. Seth back here is working with the uh, county, uh, Whatcom County Climate Impact Advisory Committee. They're looking at what can be done about climate uh, within the community. Um, my team helped the, um, the city of Bellingham develop their climate protection action plan. City council immediately said it's not fast enough. It isn't going to happen fast enough. So what can we do to accelerate the um, actions that are in this plan? So I'm facilitating the um, Climate Action Task Force right now, uh, nine amazing people who are um, going to be looking at what we can do to um, accelerate our, our efforts in the city of Bellingham. Um, if we are, we have been assigned a task which is to create an action plan that is more aggressive than any other city in the United States. So, we are going to determine the feasibility of achieving that, of course, which to a large degree has to do with money and people's attitude, right? So, um, that's the challenge that we face. Um, in addition to that, other things that are happening, um, we have the comprehensive flood hazard management planning process, or what's called the FLIP, the Floodplains Integrated Planning Process, is going on right now as well. I'm facilitating that group. Uh, the Shoreline Master Program is being uh, going to be revised here on its regular cycle. It will look at shoreline permitting and sea level rise, that type of thing. Um, we, of course, have our uh, lifelong water resource planning process that's underway. And then at, at uh, you know certain points every uh, uh, once in a while, we do significant <coughs> land use planning through the comprehensive plan as well. So all of these have the opportunity um, to look at what's going on. I would suggest that this is maybe one of our most important ones, because if we want to save the character of our community and the farm sources and so forth, we need to be thinking about that black swan, that uncharted water of many more people coming here because of the desirability of our community. Um, so now, I was supposed to be like 20 minutes back, but I got to do good news for you. Um, yeah, take your time on this. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and there, I think there is some really good news out there. Um, the, and first and foremost of that is that there, um, we have largely the technology that we need to solve this problem, okay? Um, there's a couple of odd sticking points. One is airplanes, and another one is large ships in terms of emissions control, right? We have to do all sorts of things to reduce our emissions, and we probably are going to have to pull CO2 out of the air, the best I can uh, determine. 
we can't do it all by just reducing the emissions over time. We're going to actually have to pull some out here. <clears throat> and so we have largely the technology that we need to deal with those things, and we can perhaps mitigate things like airplanes and stuff like that through uh, planting trees and things. But um, so let's just talk quickly about attitudes. Um, clearly, even in the last few weeks, the statistics are showing, you know, based on fires and storms and everything, people are getting it, right? The media is starting to talk about it like it's real and everything. <clears throat> so you, you have quite a few people that are certainly at least aware and if not, you know, really accepting what's going on. Uh, interestingly, if you're at this end of things, you're waiting for the rapture. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody tells you that they're waiting for the rapture, tell them we're in it right now. It's not going to be something that the world blows up. It's going to be a slow, painful decline that will impact their children and their grandchildren. Put it in those terms if anybody gives that stuff to you. A guy on the, my neighborhood came up and told me about how he and his dog Juliet, they were going to go together to heaven because the rapture was there. Anytime. So here's some good news. Um, the the uh, International Energy Agency, um, over a number of years from uh, 2000 up to 2007, projected solar, or excuse me, wind uh, um, adoption at these rates right here. And this, of course, this is only 2014. This goes through the roof now. Wind is actually the cheapest uh, energy source that we can do by far. Of course, it has a problem with storage, but at least it is the best option by far in terms of cost per uh, <coughs> megawatt of production. Uh, I love this one. Solar, totally blowing out. Same thing. Yeah. Nobody ever <laughs> yeah. so, Interesting thing with solar. Solar is cheap if it's done at a community level. You know, we all want to put it, I have it on my house and everything. That's the most expensive way to do it. But if we pool our money together or, or develop sites like uh, the city of Ellensburg has right along the freeway when you go out there, that's a community solar system. That's half the price of putting it on houses per kilowatt. So just something to think about in the future. The city of Bellingham is looking at how we can do community solar um, throughout the community as a more cost-effective way. This is really cool. I got to geek out on uh, econ economies, economics a little bit. Uh, in the last 10 years, uh, wind, the cost of wind generation has decreased 69% and solar 88%. Wow. So this is what's driving all of this is just, you know, and, and I will make the case throughout this part of the talk that the economic factors are what's going to make this work or not work. Whether it's us individually with gas prices and electric cars and so forth, or whether it's for insurance and businesses, uh, banks, uh, ultimately, we're, it's going to be the economics are going to drive this. This is a, a little bit of an old slide from 2012, but I love it. It came from a sort of an internal energy um, uh, consulting company that provides these reports on, on uh, trends in prices and so forth. And they, they termed this graph the terror dome. This is the price of solar dropping over like a three to five year period relative to the cost um, per uh, kilowatt of um, coal, gas, and oil. They call it the terror dome. And the reason that's happening is because solar energy is a technology. It's not a fuel or a resource, right? So as a technology, innovation drives it, makes it cheaper, makes it more available, that type of thing. And so, you know, Coal and gas, it's just the same old thing. You're just digging it out of the ground where you can make things better and better and better, whether it's wind or, um, or solar. And just to show you in, across the United States um, that uh, the, the big trends in power generation, uh, obviously coal is, is falling through the basement and uh, largely being made up with by natural gas. Of course, it, natural gas is cleaner, but it's still CO2, right? Mm -hmm. And the thing that we're going to have to deal with, and you know, we talked about this at the city yesterday, is gas is going to be the transition energy. Until we get storage, we have to have gas to make up for the peaking periods when we don't have uh, solar or wind. 
okay? So when you think about it, your your work like with the legislature, get coal out of the picture, coal strip, that kind of thing first, but understand that PSE, to meet their requirements for us right here, they're gonna be doing more natural gas as an interim measure to get us to the point of more renewable energy. Um, then of course, you got uh, the nukes for around the country, uh, largely level, hydro's level, um, here's solar just peeking up over the horizon, and here's wind doing really great. And then you look at jobs. This is the one that really gets me. It's like, we're trying to save all these coal miners, right? Yeah. What a dead-end job. Yeah. <laughs> so here you've got over 450,000 people working nationally in solar and wind, and uh, around a million still in some form of um, carbon-based fuel. But this is increasing dramatically over time, and certainly is one of the biggest job uh, sources in America right now in terms of speed at which it's growing. Um, this is hopeful. At 48 bucks a barrel, two-thirds of the world's oil is not worth digging. So the, but the key concept here is as prices for solar and wind drive down and down, making electric generation cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, it's going to push that $48 a barrel yeah. down and down and down to the point where we're sequestering as much of that carbon as possible. And that's really the outcome we want. We don't want to dig up stuff anymore um, from the ground. A lot of that's going to depend on batteries and some form of batteries. And by the way, there's a great uh, program on nature, I think it is, on battery technology. It was on PBS not long ago. And talking about batteries is not just like what we have in our cell phone or what we can put in a car, but all sorts of batteries. Here's a uh, hydraulic <laughs> battery that involves a dam where during the daytime they uh, generate electricity through solar or wind, they run a pump, it pumps it up in the lake in the nighttime, they let it back out again and, and use it for the <coughs> time energy. So there's, this is a battery of a different configuration. Mm -hmm. um, and lots of good technology coming that way. Uh, it can't happen fast enough as far as I'm concerned. When, when we were in Maui, they have thousands of houses with solar on them. It is amazing how much solar there is. And they've got like 32 windmills down there, um, but they can't deal with the nighttime. And so they're still using diesel as their primary um, source for, for the peaking time periods when they can't generate from natural sources. So they actually, during the daytime, sometimes have to shut some of the solar <coughs> off because they can't deal with it, they don't have the storage capacity. This is gonna be, I think, the, the big thing that makes a difference for us. Uh, <clears throat> the other is gonna be, um, we could just call it adoption rates. And this is a fun graph. It's a little hard to decipher everything here, but needless to say, in the early part of the 1900s, if you had, you know, wanted a gap, uh, like an electric range, or even a range, something other than a wood fire, or a refrigerator, or a radio, and it took many years for 100% adoption of that across the United States. You know, telephones, it's like, what, the 1950s that everybody got telephones in the United States? Uh, wired telephones, that is. And <clears throat> what has happened over time is that um, as technology improves and as uh, communications improve, um, the uh, adoption rates of all technologies have gone faster and faster. And of course, this is only like 2005 or something like that. Um, and that largely happens as a, as a um, the fact that we basically have a lot of different technologies coming together to make improvements. We've got communications and marketing and things that are really pushing things out there. Of course, we've got an economy that, that supports that kind of thing as well. So if you think about what are we faced with, we need adoption of really big change as fast as possible, right? That means we're all gonna have to change in what we do. And here's an example right here. Um, if you ever wanna watch a really inspiring show, check out this guy, Tony Siva, and look at his 2017 YouTube. He talks about clean energy and transportation and disruptive technology. So how do we bring things together? His case in point was, uh, how fast did people ultimately get cars? And he had a picture of downtown New York, big, you know, uh, horse carriages, and 10 years later, and, and it was one car in it. And the next picture of the same spot, 
was 10 or 15 years later was all cars and one horse carriage, right? <laughs> and so um, his thing is that when you take multiple technologies and you put them together, you get something that happens really fast. Case in point, Uber. What did it take? Cell phones, software, people who wanted to work, right? Put them together, boom, in three years, they basically outstripped the taxi company. So he's saying, one of the biggest changes we're going to face in a very short amount of time is autonomous vehicles, and that we're not even going to own those autonomous vehicles. We are going to have autonomous electric vehicles that will be supplied to us by something like Uber. And that that will happen sometime in the next 15 to 18 years because it brought together cell phone technology, uh, GPS, proximity sensors on cars, electric technology, and uh, a, um, and uh, all the software to make it run, right? And cheap power. Cheap power. That's the other thing. So it's a really... Fun show to see, and I, I would uh, suggest anybody take a look at it. Here's another one, technology-wise, right up here in Squamish, there's a guy, MIT grad, who has developed a CO2 removal system that is large enough to make a real difference. It's a demonstration project right now. And, uh, and this system not only pulls CO2 out of the air, but it creates fuel that you can put back in your car. And it does it at a price that at least Canadians can afford. <laughs> I mean, they're paying higher gas prices. They're paying the true cost of gas, probably. Close to <coughs> so this is really exciting. It could be, uh, I mentioned to you before, I think that one of the keys to this is not only reducing emissions, but also um, it, we have to pull some of it out of the air. Uh, economics, again, back to, you know, Banks and insurance companies are basically absorbing the risk of climate, whether it's industry, uh, agriculture, houses, buildings, whatever, right? They have the risk, and they're beginning to get the picture. Here's a report from the um, reinsurance people for um, all the insurance companies on what their risk of climate is. Citibank did another one for uh, uh, banking and, and finance and the risks that are associated with that. I think ultimately they're gonna say, you know, you can't build a house here because of flood or because of this and that. They're already saying they're, they're already saying. Right, so this is, this is what may make a, a big difference. Of course, it's gonna create incredible hardship for people too. So, but it's the great leveler, right? All the people who can, I know some of you may live on the waterfront, but all of the people who live in low-lying waterfront places, you know, that can afford to live in those places are at risk, right? So not just poor people in this world. Cities are doing great things. They are leading the way. Um, big conferences and, and conversations sharing a lot of information about what successes they've had. Uh, the, the C40 was the, um, the first one that got things going with some of the, the really big cities in the world. Um, we are, uh, the city of Bellingham is part of the, of the uh, Global Covenant of Mayors, and um, so we're um, participating and learning from what they're doing. Um, there's some great cities, like the city of Boulder is probably leading the way in terms of really understanding what's practical and what people can tolerate and what it change and what it's going to take to do it. So we have a lot that we can learn from those places. We also can learn from some pretty cool communities um, that are really going for it. This is from a trip Allison and I made to um, Denmark a, a year ago. Uh, Copenhagen, of course, is like the ground zero for climate. If you walk around Copenhagen, they got so little free board, you know, to, for sea level rise. I don't know what they're going to do, but they're also the bike city. They're the you know, emissions, organic gardening, all that stuff. But this is two islands that we visited. Uh, uh, SAMHSA, the one on the left, is 3,400 people, 100% energy self-sufficient. They actually sell their energy back to the mainland. Um, they have electric ferries to get back and forth. Um, they cool. do it with a combination of wind turbines and solar, biogas, uh, district heating, a whole variety of things. Um, and they did it largely because of that guy right there, Soren Hermanson 
who started what's called the Energy Academy, and now he's challenging, he's got, they have a program called SAMHSA 100, where they're looking for 100 small communities in the world, and he flies out and he shows them exactly what they did to get where they are, and helps them work, he and his wife work through a process with them to think about priorities and how it works. Um, this is uh, Bornholm, which is an island off the southeastern coast of Sweden. It belongs to Denmark, it has uh, about 40,000 people in it. They're 60% self-sufficient right now from energy. Um, this is a little, is a cool little um, uh, real-time monitor that's at the ferry terminal. When you come onto the island, it tells you uh, how much uh, uh, wind, uh, biogas, er, um, I'm not sure which one that biogas and solar and so forth is being generated, and whether the power is going to Sweden or whether they're pulling power from Sweden. At any moment in time, it tells you what they're doing right there. Their goal is by 2025 to be 100% self sufficient. So communities can do it if they can pull together, get on a common track and a common vision, and can, can make it happen. So. Much future are we talking about? Are we prepared to get cooked or not? You know, the old frog story, right? Okay. We have experience working on these things. I myself started my career at the state in the acid rain program, I worked on the national program and the state program. Both. Uh, we solved that acid rain thing to a large degree. Of course, it didn't involve each of us with individual choices every day so much. It was largely power plants and and industry that was the focus of that. But still, we have an ability to do things at that scale. We certainly worked as a world on the ozone issue very successfully. Um, there's been some effort, of course, to try and save whales. And if you just look at, in terms of equitability and rich countries paying for poor countries, the Marshall Plan helped us put Europe back on its feet and, and, uh, and got things going again there. So there are models out there. Um, for how we can do this, it's just more complicated than anything anybody's ever tackled before. So if, you, if I leave you with anything, here's your three things. We gotta reduce combustion, increase electrification, and whatever power we've got has to be clean renewable power. That's the basis of everything if you think about where we're headed. So as you think about, like we went down to a little event in Mount Vernon last night, we took our Prius, 58 miles to the gallon, right? Made a choice about a Prius, if that met our needs. But still, it was like a half a gallon of gas, you know, to drive down to Mount Vernon and back. That's 10 pounds of CO2 we put in. So every gallon, 20 pounds. If you think about that every time you drive. So those are things to be thinking about. So here, this is what I think is a good hierarchical list. This is in the handout, so you don't need to write it down. But obviously, we need political action. And you are the right people for that, I can tell. Uh, and, you, and we need to speak up. We need to be brave and talk to our family members and others. I mean, in Allison's and my extended family, uh, there's only two people that believe in climate change. Wow. Oh, and they're all educated people. It's so we need to be brave enough to talk about that. The eat meat thing. You know, when you think about agriculture, it's not just the cows, it's what we did to create the corn and the feed and the tractors and the transportation, all that stuff. If we can eat meat one day or two days less a week, it makes a huge difference. Huge, huge difference. Or go um, vegan. Or go yeah. vegan, yeah. right. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't ask people to do that. Just make a difference, more than that, right? <laughs> if you're vegan, awesome. That's great. We are. Um, we can all buy green power. It's not that expensive, and there's two different levels you can buy at. Um, check that out with PSE. The one level actually really helps them get um, more um, green power production going. Of course, the drive less, carpool, ride bike, walk, all that kind of stuff. We, we all have known that for years. We just need to really do it. For those of you who are grandparents, everywhere I go is like grandparents. Fly less! <laughs> But if you fly, try and do it last. Try and connect trips together. And if you have to fly, sometimes you can buy uh, offsets from some of the airlines now. I know Allegiant sells offsets now. Um, and it's like, you know, seven bucks for a trip to San Francisco. It's like nothing, right? Um, you can also buy offsets from different uh, organizations out online, too. They help build the rainforest back up. There's even one that helps with uh, methane capture from. Uh, garbage dumps and stuff like that. You can get all sorts of different things that way. Um, 
uh, when you when you one of the things that they told me in Boulder was they're trying to get people to think ahead about when they replace something. So if you or know that you're going to replace a car, then think about first what do you really need? You know, we see people driving big trucks all over the place. It's like what is this? You know, in our family, everybody drives. <laughs> big ass vehicles, right? <laughs> and if that's what you really need for the job or for transporting people, that's one thing. But if you can get by with a smart, energy efficient car, best would be electric. Electric's amazing. We have a Nissan Leaf as well as our Prius. Um, and when you start thinking about not stopping at gas stations, and, and the repairs on an electric car are a fraction of if anything compared to what they are in a gas car. Um, the savings are enormous. And the price of electric cars, uh, Hyundai just came out with an electric car now that is cheaper than their gas car. Wow. So plan ahead, think about that next car, so that when the choice comes, you go like, okay, well maybe it's three years, maybe it's five, maybe it's two, make that choice. In our company sustainability plan, my son said, the next lease you get is an electric car. That's it, you just say, that's what it is. In two more years, we're gonna get electric. Um, same with your, um, uh, insulating your home, uh, that's obvious. If you're converting, if, if you need to replace a hot water heater or a stove or uh, a furnace, convert to electric as soon as you can. Um, but that ultimately, ultimately, today maybe not, but as we get coal out of the power system, ultimately it's going to be a cleaner source of power, especially as we get more renewable power in there. So we want to see everybody convert to electric as quickly as possible, um, and with, and whether that's heating or whatever. And oddly enough, it's like the people I talk about stoves, they're like, it's like guns, you know? <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to rip that gas stove out of my cold dead hands. <laughs> <laughs> so I think gas stoves might be one of the hard ones. <laughs> and then ultimately, you know, if you have the resources uh, and, and you want to get involved in solar generation, um, it, it's a great thing. Uh, it, you know, as long, especially with the incentives that they can keep those going, uh, it's been wonderful for us. And, and so that's sort of your hierarchical order. In terms of just what to, the takeaways here today, you know, the, obviously the evidence is increasing rapidly for things that are happening out there, and attitudes are changing to be more, more accepting of that. Um, we've got some big displacement health and and uh, other economic challenges that we face. Um, we need to make changes everywhere we can, uh, and especially on the energy side of it. To dip, and uh, we need to know that we have all that technology. It's there if you're willing to go that route, take that chance, and, and try something. And then uh, just in terms of our local list right here, if you're advocating, uh, we obviously have our water issues continuing. Flooding, sea level rise, wildfire, fire, and then that big one, which is what do we do with all the people? So those are in terms of political, local political act activism. So here's a beautiful shot of our Earth from space. You know, we do it this last shot. And when you think about it, that little atmosphere is as thin as the skin on an apple. Conceptually, that's just amazing to me, you know. And we think about the millions of times, not a, only of pollutants, but of heat. Because all our cars, everything generates heat too, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the unspoken conversation that isn't really happening out there. All that's getting absorbed in that little thin light blue area there. And really, that's all we have that makes our planet live. Anyway, I've kept you 20 minutes longer than I said. questions because I see people are standing all this time in the back and I can talk a little bit afterwards. Back here first. Yeah. Uh, uh, Rich Hart here. Uh, excellent talk. Thank Congratulations. You. Uh, I'm a biologist yep. and so these talks seem to be coming from you know geologists, resource persons. I like to give a little comment from a biologist. I've had 35 year career seed collecting locally yep. made of plants and uh, I've noticed over my time same groves 
year after year, 300 species of plants in my experience. Vine maple, the seed ripening date for vine maple has moved from the middle of September to the middle of August. Good data, same groves over and over again. In IPCC report, uh, I, you know, I've been foraging around on this. There's, there's uh, 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 stories about, you know, elevational differences and temperature differences, uh, insects and animals that depend on, on uh, seed ripening dates and, and uh, uh, so on. We've got impacts to organisms other than us humans. This is what I'm hearing about impacts on us humans, but we also have humans, uh, we also have in impacts on the ecosystem as whole. Thank you very much. Thank you. Stay in I was just going to say overpopulation drives climate change. Family yeah. planning and small yeah. families, one or two or even no kids, adopt is the way to go. <laughs> Like we do in our farm for frost protection, right? We have these big fans that take the hot air and push it down to keep the warm air in the orchard. And I read something that that's what's happening with all the wind power. Is there any truth to that? I haven't read anything about it. So they're, they're not, there's no propulsion from a wind turbine. It's using energy, but it's not, it's not a propulsion. Yeah. It's not pushing air. <laughs> Right now, that would make sense. Good. Um, just letting you know, the city of Bellingham just decided to purchase a wind turbine, along with several other municipalities. They're going in on it together. And the good news about that is it's going to raise the um, renewable energy level on the grid. It's not just an exchange. So it's good for the city of Bellingham. Yeah, the city buys power from the, uh, in the Green Direct program, which means that they're investing specifically in infrastructure improvements through PSE. And in, in theory, they get credit for that, right? But even though it just goes into the mix for the, for the whole grid. Well, our biggest resource is conservation, more than solar, more than wind. Um, and so conservation of water and energy are, are, is our biggest opportunity, easiest, and makes our life more enjoyable for the most part. We absolutely have to consider for us. Yeah. Introduce yourself because you are. Uh, <laughs> you are somebody. My now. name is Atul. I was recently elected to the Washington County community, and I work on water and energy policy. All right. Well, I just, uh, I'm with the North Cascades Audubon, and I think it's great that we have wind energy. We have to cite these things very carefully with regard to wildlife. Yeah. So if you want to be a part of that process, we're going to weigh in. Just on the note of what you previously said here, the, there's a really important election coming up for the Whatcom Conservation District Board of Directors. It's been going in an anti-regulation direction. And yet the, it has the board members, the last couple ones who were elected, are like more the county type people, mm -hmm. anti regulation, want to be able to develop land in my opinion. And um, no. I think um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a weird, the way the funding goes, they can't have a big general election. So, what you have to do is you have to contact the conservation district, you should, like look up their website, Walk Home Conservation District, and you have to request <coughs> a ballot, and you need to do it really soon, or else there's one right, day right. that you go out to right. live in both, but they're along the lines. So, um, I haven't really heard Take a couple more questions, and I'll let you go. You talked about uh, gas being the uh, transition um, energy. Yeah, and um, like it's better than the other fossil fuels. Does that take into account the damage of fracking? Because that just is, I think, the most horrifying thing. No, I've it doesn't, of. doesn't take that into account. Yeah. <laughs> so it's but in, in terms of its impact, in, and in terms of pollution, that natural gas is far better than coal. For the for the air quality. For the air quality. Yeah, yeah but, but we're not, not taking that. Yeah. yeah. David, I would, I would add to that last point though. If you have methane releases 
as much as 3% in the entire chain with natural gas. The heat trapping is actually the equivalent to coal, yeah. so it is not a clean, rich fuel. That has been way over yeah. that by that. And that, that's definitely a problem. They have a lot of leakage in the system and, and has not been adequately addressed, for sure. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, is it possible for us to get a copy of your PowerPoint along with the, part, the one page? Yeah, I, I'll send a, a PDF of it um, to um, Liam. And then the other thing is I'd like to piggyback on what the biologist said. If you could emphasize the effects of the climate change on non-human yeah. creatures, mm -hmm. that would be helpful, I think. Yeah, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, sir. You know, they, uh, on Tuesday evening, the Whatcom County Council will be once again us, uh, evaluating the, uh, the moratorium on development at Cherry Point. Yep. And there's also, they're also in the process of developing a longer range plan to manage permitting for all the future activities. So we don't have to do a piecemeal uh, uh, operation every time a project comes up. And, and But more importantly, give the county some control. At this point in time, they very little control over development in the past, historically. So that's a key meeting. It's taking place at 7 o'clock. If you want to speak, you come at 6.30 and, and sign up, put your name on the list, and wear red. Uh, and so that's the thing. Well, no, no, I'm not sure. Todd Donovan has a plan that was just gave you a week ago, which is a very, it gives a very good explanation of that, probably on the website uh, of the one last question. Uh, well, you haven't had very many questions. You've had a lot of comments. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody who says, oh, I don't want to go tonight, or oh, I can't make it. If you want to really make a difference in climate change, then you have to participate as many ways, whatever your level is, as many ways as you can. Please show up. Right on. So, so I think I'll thank you. And we have a little before the coffee all disappeared. Thank you very much.